Welcome everybody. This is the Computational Sustainability Virtual Seminar Series. Um, we are happy to offer this opportunity for those interested in computing and sustainability across the globe. If you'd like to say hello to everybody, then go to the chat window at the top of the screen and chat a message to everyone. So I'll give you a second to do that. We are happy to offer this, again, this opportunity to everybody. The virtual seminar series is being organized by CompSusNet with support from the National Science Foundation and Cornell University. My name is Doug Fisher, and I am the Director of Outreach, Education, Diversity, and Synthesis of CompSusNet. I and other members of the outreach team, which include Carla Gomes, Christiane White, and Rich Bernstein, will be scheduling talks on computational sustainability regularly and posting them to the URL given at the top of this slide. We have talks by Professor Malin Tanby of University of Southern California and Professor Bistra Delkina of Georgia Tech in the coming weeks. During the webinar, you can ask questions through the question and answer facility on Zoom, uh, which will be relayed to the speakers time allows and certainly at the end of the talk. If you have difficulty with today's seminar, make sure that you contact us and we will set up a test run for your node uh, before future seminars. CompSusNet has several social media outlets, including Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and the CompSusNet blog, again, at our website, which you can find at the website at the top of the link. Um, today's speaker is Professor Tom Diederich. Uh, Tom received his bachelor's from Overland College and master's degree from University of Illinois. He received a, his PhD from Stanford University in 1984, and he is a distinguished professor emeritus of computer science at Oregon State University. Tom is past president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence and past president of the International Machine Learning Society. Tom is also the deputy director of CompSusNet and a leader in eco, ecosystem informatics as well as machine learning and AI more broadly. It's a pleasure to have Tom Diederich today. Tom? Okay, let's see if I can switch to share my screen. Beautiful. All right. Well, it's a great chance to, uh, to, to help uh, get this computational sustainability seminar going. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, really uh, great to have a worldwide audience. So um, the work I'm going to be describing today, um, my title is Solving MDPs for Ecosystem Management Lessons Learned, uh, is joint work with a, a pretty big team here at Oregon State um, uh, and really involves two projects, one on invasive species management, um, which is uh, co-led by Joe Albers, who's now at the University of Wyoming, her graduate student Kim Hall, and my student Majid Alki Taliban. And then the second part is uh, about wildfire management, um, co-led by Claire Montgomery here at Oregon State University. Uh, our former postdoc, Mark Crowley, is now at Waterloo. Uh, and then graduate students, Chris Lauer, Sean McGregor, Haley Buckingham, and Rachel Hauptman uh, have made contributions at various points. And this is all funded by the National Science Foundation. We started this under the first Computational Sustainability Expedition Grant. And then uh, uh, we still have a bit of funding on a no-cost extension under the Cyber Seas program. Okay, so, so the talk will basically be, have two parts to it. Um, are you seeing my face too or not? Let's see. Oh, well. Um, uh, the, uh, the first part will be about invasive species management and river networks, and the second part will be uh, about uh, wildfire management. So um, uh, for, the, for the first part, our focus has been on the tamarisk, which is a a, a tree that is native to the Middle East, but has been invading the Intermountain West in the United States, uh, including in New Mexico, in the Rio Grande Valley, where it has become a major consumer of water, outcompeting the native vegetation and uh, humans for water in the Rio Grande, um, and uh, having an impact on the biodiversity of the, of the river system. So the question is, if you have a spatially spreading organism in general, the question is, how should you manage it? Um, and this theme of spatial spread actually, I think, uh, permeates a lot of the 
issues in ecosystems with computational sustainability. And so the main computational tool that we uh, apply is uh, the Markov decision process. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so, so the purpose of a Markov decision process is to control a system in order to optimize the total reward that we get from that system. Um, and so it's made up of, of uh, uh, it has a very, the following form. At, at time t, the system is in some state s sub t. So we'll suppose, for instance, that the state is in some s naught, some initial state. And then um, we have a controller that must choose an action at each time. In this case, say the controller needs to choose between action A1 uh, of, uh, or action A2. And there's some space of those possible actions. So suppose it chooses action A2. Then we receive some reward, um, uh, which is really uh, could be the cost of the action, but also maybe uh, something about the how good state S0 was to begin with. Um, so in our invasive species problem, for instance, if there's a large amount of tamarisk, in, in in state s naught, then then we get a, a penalty for that, and and then there's the cost of the action that we're taking. Now this is just the immediate cost and the or the immediate benefit of executing that action in that state, and then the system makes a probabilistic transition to the next state according to some unknown probability distribution in our case, which is the conditional probability of the next state s t plus one, given state s t and action a t. So we'll say, in this case, perhaps uh, the transition was to state S2. So you can see that this unfolds a bit like uh, a, a game of chess or something, where we move from one board position to another. Uh, it's also, we can sort of think of it as a stochastic finite state machine um, that is taking our input actions and transforming them into the output rewards. So um, the thing we're interested in is this object we call a policy, which is a function that maps from the state space to the action space that specifies what action should we choose in each state. And we use the, the Greek letter pi for policy, uh, since p was already taken for probability. Um, and we'll view this as a, a function in this case. And then our optimization objective is to, is to uh, maximize, in our case, we'll say the expected discounted cumulative reward. So um, at time step one, we get some reward R1, and that's a potentially a random variable because it depends on what action we chose um, and, and on what state we're in. And then at time two, we get some a, a new reward R2, but we discount it by a factor gamma and so on, off to infinity. And this is all conditioned on starting in state S0 and executing this particular policy pi. Now there is some, there, there can be one or more optimal policies, pi star, that maximize this objective function j. And we would really like to find at least one of those. So um, it turns out it's also very useful to think about something called the value function. Uh, so the value of a state st when we're executing a policy is the expected discounted reward that we receive from, from time t onwards. Okay, and that's called the value of that state. And we're interested, of course, in the value of the start state is the thing we'd most like to see. Um, and, uh, and so we can uh, kind of, there, there, there are equations that relate the value of the resulting states and the probability transition function to the value of the start state. This is known as the famous Bellman equation, but we're not really gonna use that in this talk, so I won't introduce it. Well, why do we like MDPs? Well, one of the uh, advantages of them is that it, it um, the idea of an optimal policy is that it's able to make short-term sacrifices to achieve longer-term payoffs. And this is very important in sustainability applications where we may need to experience quite a bit of initial cost in order to get some water benefit. The discount factor is also important because it controls the balance between the near term and the long term. Um, but it does pose a kind of challenge for what does it mean to be sustainable? Because one might think that, uh, for instance, we, we would like to consider the uh, system operating infinitely forever and we shouldn't be discounting the long term for the short term. But, um, but if you set the discount factor to one, the, these problems become very unstable. Um, and so it, in, in general, it's important to have a discount. And in fact, in the US uh, Forest Service, there's an official discount factor 0.96 that's used for all, all modeling. Um, the other reason we like Markov decision processes is they let us handle the uncertainty in the system dynamics. So the key thing here is really we are planning and acting under this uncertainty about exactly how the system works 
and how it will, what transitions will occur in the future. An interesting fact is that um, the optimal policy pi star maximizes the value, which we'll denote by v star, the optimal value, simultaneously in every state. So this is a kind of remarkable fact, I think. Um, but in particular, it is the policy that optimizes the value of the starting state. So <clears throat> now let's turn to our Tamaris problem. Um, we, we're solving a somewhat stylized version. So this is a river network over here on the right. You can imagine two streams here uh, joining uh, to be create a third stream, which joins with a fourth to create the final river uh, that exits, say, here at the ocean or something. Um, but as computer scientists, we will also think of this as a tree graph in which the edges are, are numbered, um, and we're really going to focus on those edges. Now, on each edge of the network, we're going to define, say, that there's some number of sites along the river that can be occupied either by a native tree, by a tamarisk tree T, or can be empty. Um, and so uh, the, the number of states in the system then is 3 to the power eh, where e is the number of edges and h is the number of habitat sites. Um, uh, so, so the uh, challenge here is that the state space grows quite large if we let the river network get very big. And then at each time, in each, we can perform a management action in each edge. And that action could be to do nothing uh, along this edge, just let whatever's going to happen happen. Or we might uh, eradicate. So we go in and try to kill this tamarisk tree. Um, that will only succeed with some probability. We could also plant a native species into this empty slot here. Or we have a fourth action, which is to eradicate a plant, where we would eradicate this tamarisk, try to plant a native in this place, and also plant a native in this empty slot. So the number of actions is 4 to the power e. Um, and then we're going to put a budget constraint on here, which says that we, we really can't afford to act in all of these states, so all of these edges at once. And so uh, we're going to constrain ourselves to doing, to, to doing the do nothing action in all but one of the edges in each time step. Um, and you know we play around with that quite a bit. So now, what are the transition dynamics? Well, we're using a model that was developed um, at Princeton um, in, in, uh, and for, for just modeling uh, generically spread in river networks. In each time period, uh, there's going to be some natural death. So for instance, this tamarisk tree here died uh, with some probability. And then uh, each of the trees will reproduce by making some number of seeds. <clears throat> and that again is, is a, a random function that depends on the uh, fecundity of the species and so on. Then those seeds are going to disperse through the river network. And this is the key step, the dispersal model. And uh, this dispersal is preferentially downstream, but there, there is a small probability of going upstream. I'm not sure what the mechanism would be for that. Maybe a bird carries the seed upstream or something. And then the seeds compete to become established. So in particular, let's look at this, this uh, slot here, where we had two native seeds arrived and two tamarisk seeds. And they need to compete to become established in that slot. And the tamarisks won that competition. Um, and so um, <clears throat> the, this, this uh, seed competition is actually uh, really bad from a computer science computational perspective because it, it couples all of the edges together. Um, because every possible uh, source location could contribute a seed to this destination location. And then all of them interact to decide what happens here. So that makes uh, probabilistic inference to calculate the probabilities of each state transition uh, intractable. So as I said, our goal is to minimize the, minimize the expected discounted costs. So we're going to think about this in terms of the cost and we'll uh, give ourselves a cost for being invaded and a cost for management subject to this annual budget constraint. So um, there are uh, many algorithms for exactly solving Markov decision processes. And in particular, if we know the transition probability function and the reward function and the starting state and the transition function, or I mean the discount factor, and if our probability transition function fits as a matrix into memory, then we can actually compute the optimal policy and value function in something like uh, soft O of poly time in the, the number of actions, the number of states, and one over one minus gamma, the, the discount factor. <clears throat> Now for Tamarisk, um, we've looked at uh, problem instances that are small enough that the transition probability does fit into memory. Unfortunately, we don't know the, the contents. We can allocate the memories for it, but we don't know what values to plug in for that because our probability transitions, the, the probabilities are defined by the simulator instead of by a closed form. 
So we call this a problem the problem of simulator-defined MDPs. And this is what leads us into using reinforcement learning algorithms to try to solve them. So we have a simulator such that given a chosen state in action, we can draw a sample of the result state, S prime, distributed according to this transition function. And we're also told what the reward is. In our work, we're assuming the rewards are, are deterministic, but uh, they can be stochastic also. And what we want to do is try to find a policy pi hat that with high probability is nearly optimal. Um, that is with probability one minus delta, the, the optimal value uh, uh, minus the, our estimate of the, of the optimal value from this policy, uh, the difference is less than epsilon. So um, an algorithm that draws a polynomial number of samples from the simulator uh, and then outputs a policy pi hat uh, in polynomial time is uh, said to be PAC RL, but PAC, uh, probably approximately correct reinforcement learning. Now, you can, it turns out you can view this as basically specifying a confidence interval over what the true uh, uh, value is. So, so um, we don't know V star, but based on the samples that, we can, that we've drawn, we can compute upper and lower confidence bounds on it, uh, such that V star is trapped between them. And, uh, and the width of that confidence interval, we want that width to be less than epsilon. So we know what the optimal value is down to some accuracy. And that means that if we execute this policy pi hat, <clears throat> our total reward, our cumulative reward, will be within epsilon of the uh, cumulative reward of the optimum policy with high probability. So the question that we really want to answer in this talk is, how should we sample from the simulator in order to most efficiently shrink that confidence interval? Um, now, if the simulator was super cheap, um, we could just draw tons of samples. But, but even then, um, if you try a brute force approach on this, you need an awful lot of samples, um, tens, hundreds, uh, or even billions of examples, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of, of examples. Uh, so it, it pays to be smart about this sampling. And that's what our research has been about. And so we've developed two algorithms uh, for doing this sampling. The first is called DDV, and we published that at AAAI 2013. <clears throat> and we also just had a paper come out in JMLR about uh, uh, revealing that too. Um, and then the other algorithm that I'm going to describe is, uh, the, um, uh, is called LGCV. Um, and we have a manuscript at the Journal of Machine Learning uh, Research that's under review. Okay, so our algorithms are based on three um, basic ideas. Uh, and uh, the first two, uh, we are not uh, uh, unique in applying these. Um, the third one, I think, is, is perhaps uh, a unique contribution of our work. So the, the are the optimism principle, value of information, and optimal sampling for policy evaluation. So what is the optimism principle? Well, many of you may be familiar with um, <clears throat> the problem that's called the K-armed bandit problem. We imagine we have K slot machines and, uh, and, and we, we would like to know, and each of these slot machines is actually uh, a Bernoulli random variable that has a pay, gives us $1 with probability P1 or P2 up to PK. So each machine has its own payoff probability. And at each time step, we can choose one of these K arms to pull, and, and we get a sample from that machine of, of whether it paid off for us or not, right? And the best arm band of problem we're finding the, uh, is the problem of trying to find which of these machines has the highest payoff. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to draw some number of samples from these uh, bandits. Um, we don't really care what, we, what money we make while we're doing that. It's pure exploration. And then we want to output an arm that is within epsilon of the optimal arm. So we'll let PK star be the payoff probability, the biggest of the PKs, the one that is the optimal arm to pull. And, uh, and, and then we've got the arm that, that we are outputting as our proposal. And we want the difference to be less than some amount epsilon. But we want to do this while minimizing the number of arm pulls. So we want to do this efficiently. I use minimize in this case loosely. We want to economize um, on the arm pulls. So this has been studied a lot, um, and there are really are two formulations. I've, I have uh, uh, described the pure exploration formulation, which is that we just want to find the best arm, or an approximately best arm. The other formulation is the lifetime regret formulation. That is to say, um, we look at our, uh, 
we, we all we do is pull arms forever um, and we want to uh, maximize our total um, uh, return that we get, possibly discounted, but our total return from doing all those experiments. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, what we, uh, and, and, and it turns out that the methods I'm going to describe in this talk are not appropriate for that total regret. Our regret is how much worse we would do than if we had been pulling the optimal arm from the very beginning. Um, uh, instead, our problem is we want to find, in our case, an optimal policy that we can then show to policymakers and have them think about and reflect on and maybe uh, tell us we were to change the objective function and so on. So we're interested in the policy as something to be studied and discussed, uh, not just something to act upon forever. In fact, we're highly skeptical that uh, policymakers would actually use our policy directly without uh, challenging it. So the, the main idea for um, uh, exploring in care and bandit problems, or one of them has been this idea of the upper confidence bound. So if we let N of AK be the number of times that we've pulled arm K, and H of K be the number of heads, the number of times that that arm paid off, then P hats of K can be estimated just by H divided by N, the fraction of poles where we got a payoff. Um, and we can compute a binomial confidence interval on PK using the hoofding bound, for example, and, and uh, get a confidence interval on these things. And the optimism principle says at each step, pull the arm that has the highest upper bound on it. Um, and we're being optimistic because we're assuming that every arm is actually paying off according to our, our upper bound on it, not according to its actual payoffs. And so the best arm is the one with the highest upper bound. Now, of course, if, if the upper bound is large, that could happen for two reasons. The first one could be it's a very good arm, and so pulling it is, is, is the right thing to do. But the other reason could be that, that we haven't tried that arm very much yet, and so it has a very wide confidence interval because we're mostly ignorant about it. And in that case, pulling that arm is a good idea for exploration because it's going to give us more samples for that arm. So, so that's, the, that's why this so-called upper confidence bound or optimism under, under uncertainty bound, uh, algorithm is, uh, is a good heuristic. Um, and when the confidence interval of the best arm has width less than epsilon, then we can terminate. And there is some excitement about um, these delta factors in the algorithm, uh, which I will not go into. Well, so how does this K-armed bandit problem relate to our Markov decision processes? Well, every state we can think of as being like a K-armed bandit. We have some number of actions we can perform in that state. Those are our bandits. And each of those actions will have some long-term benefit uh, that is the, the expected value of the resulting state. And there's a notation called the Q value that can be used for that. And, um, uh, and so in each state, the best action to, to, to do will be the one that leads to the best results. The trick is that, of course, these results depend on how we behave in all the other states. And so there's a bit of a recursive um, uh, aspect to this. Um, but we can define, uh, it turns out that we can compute confidence intervals on these Q values. Um, and then we can define the upper confidence bound to be the, uh, the uh, upper confidence bound policy to be the policy that, that, that uh, chooses the action that maximizes the upper bound. The, the, uh, on. So it's really just the, the same thing. It's the uh, optimism policy based on these confidence intervals. And the same reasoning applies. Uh, this could be a good action. To, if this action has a very high upper bound, it could be because it's a really good action or because we don't have very many samples of it yet, and so our confidence interval is very wide. So the second idea underlying our methods is a value of information argument. <clears throat> and and uh, the idea is that we should uh, choose to sample the state action here, uh, you know, invoke the simulator on, in that state and with that action uh, that will give us the most information about the MDP. And in particular, will give us the most information about the value of the start state. So um, uh, with a little bit of abusive notation, I'm going to call delta V of S naught the, the, the width of the confidence interval in the start state, the difference between the upper bound and the lower confidence bound on the start state. Now, for every state action pair, we can estimate how much that confidence interval delta V would change, how much it would shrink if we sampled uh, that state action pair. Um, we don't do this exactly. We have an approximate method. Um, and so we're interested now in, in, I'm using this delta to mean change. So how much would delta V change as a result of sampling SA? Like what would be 
its current width, and then the width that would result after we uh, do the sampling. Um, and so we call this delta delta v, um, but it's maybe not such a good name. But in any case, um, uh, under the optimism principle, we're going to consider only state action pairs where the action is uh, the optimistic action in that state. And then we, we, we uh, compute this estimate, and then we're going to sample uh, the, the, uh, the state action pair that we, thinks will, that we believe in expectation will most decrease the width of the confidence interval in the start state. And we just repeatedly do that until the confidence interval uh, has a width less than epsilon. Um, now, the confidence intervals are calculated using a method known as extended value iteration. Um, and uh, explaining that is, is, uh, is a whole talk in itself. So you'll just have to trust me that, that such an algorithm exists and it works. Um, but it gives us uh, confidence intervals uh, of the start state and over all of the other states as well. OK, the third idea that we have <clears throat> Um, is based on optimal sampling for policy evaluation. Um, and uh, the idea here is that suppose, uh, let's think about a different problem than our optimization problem, which is just simulator-defined policy evaluation. Suppose I give you a simulator-defined Markov decision process, like our Tamarisk problem, with some start state, which is the current state of the ecosystem, and I give you a fixed policy, and I just say, how good is this policy? What would be the expected return uh, discounted expected cumulative return um, if we execute this policy in this state. And, uh, and we just want to sample from the MDP in order to get a good bound on the value of this policy. So this is now we want the difference between the true value of this policy and our estimated value of this policy to be less than epsilon with probability one minus delta. Now it turns out that um, we can actually uh, compute the optimal sampling strategies for this problem. So we can solve this problem. Um, and, and, uh, and it depends, though, the, the solution depends on how you're calculating your confidence intervals. Um, and so uh, it turns out that if you calculate your confidence intervals using extended value iteration, you get one answer. And if you calculate your confidence intervals using Monte Carlo trials, that is, you just uh, execute the policy uh, out to some horizon H, some number of times and then uh, make your estimate from that, you should sample using a different method. So in particular, um, there's this thing called the occupancy measure, which is the discounted probability of the number of times the policy uh, pi will visit a particular state when you run it. And this is known as the occupancy measure, as I say here, mu pi of s. And if you're using extended value iteration to compute your confidence intervals, then you should sample state action pairs in proportion to uh, mu pi of s raised to the two thirds power, which is kind of a surprising result. But the effect of this is that you actually draw more samples from deeper in the MDP than you would if you were just sampling uh, according to the policy itself. Whereas for Monte Carlo trials, it's pretty obvious. You should just sample by sampling along trajectories. Um, but there's some excitement about it calculating exactly how deep you should go before you terminate a trajectory and start a new one in the starting state. But that means you're going to sample state action pairs according to mu pi of s, or something close to it. That's an undiscounted version of mu pi of s. So the intuition of, um, I think I missed a slide here someplace. Let me just make sure that I do. Um, OK, I guess I did present this. Yeah, OK. Um, maybe this is a good point to en entertain any questions, if there are some. I'm not seeing any questions on the chat window. OK, so you've already seen the DDV algorithm. Here's the second algorithm, the uh, LGCV algorithm. The idea is to combine two different ways of computing the confidence intervals, um, extended value iteration and Monte Carlo sampling. Um, and we use extended value iteration to calculate our upper confidence limit and extended value iteration plus Monte Carlo sampling to compute the lower uh, limit. And it turns out this gives us a tighter bound on the lower limit. And then in each iteration, we can either draw a mini batch of samples to improve the, uh, the upper, to reduce the upper bound or, or improve the EVI confidence interval, or we can draw a mini batch of samples to improve the, uh, the Monte Carlo interval. And, uh, and we stop again when the difference between the upper and lower bounds is less than epsilon. And the big advantage of this over DDV is it's a lot more efficient to compute um, uh, 
uh, uh, and we can do pretty good sized mini batches uh, of samples. Um, and it's also maybe less myopic. The value of information here just really look, is looking one step ahead. Um, whereas this is actually doing optimal sampling, uh, assuming that, uh, that our current policy is, uh, is good and we want to really uh, estimate its value better. So um, uh, let's see, I already talked about that. So, so we've done a ser series of experiments um, uh, over four uh, benchmark problems from the Markov decision process literature and four different Tamaris configurations. Uh, this is a three edge, one habitat network, and here's a five edge, one habitat network, and so on. So they're different river network sizes. The vertical axis is the number of samples, and it's the number of samples we have to take until the confidence interval has width 0.1 times the, um, the, the maximum value of the, of the state. Um, so, so we're trying to reduce things to 10% of, of what the naive uh, uh, confidence interval would be. Now there are three algorithms here. The, the, um, the only previous algorithm that was specifically designed for this kind of problem, PACRL algorithm, was uh, developed by a guy named Fichter back in the 90s. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then these are our two algorithms, LGCB and DDB. And what we can see is that um, we, we set ourselves a ceiling of 10 million samples, and Fichter uh, ran into that limit uh, in five of the domains. Um, and we can see then that, that uh, DDB works quite well, and this is a log scale, so we're getting, uh, you know, like an order of magnitude improvement in many cases, and, and at least a factor of two improvement in, in, in all domains. And uh, uh, LGCV, uh, sometimes it's not as good as DDV, um, but, but on our Tamrisk instances, three out of the four Tamrisk instances, we got uh, substantial improvements using it, particularly these two here, right? Huge, huge uh, benefits from using it. So, so it's uh, our, currently our favorite algorithm for, uh, for solving these problems. Okay, so um, we've also done some comparison against some uh, published rule of thumb policies that, that have been in the literature. And these are mostly taken by a paper from Yedin Shades's work. Um, and uh, so hi, Yedin. Um, uh, so, uh, and we tried to, these were stated in, in other settings. So we had to kind of interpret them in, in the condition of our river network. Um, so the triage policy is to treat the most invaded edge first, whatever it is. And then we broke ties by um, uh, uh, treating upstream first. Um, another, uh, a, a very intuitive policy that's used for uh, things that are simply spreading like an expanding wave front is to um, treat the leading edge of the invasion. Um, now, the thing about river networks is that there isn't really that wave front because a seed can travel pretty far uh, in the river network in one time step. So, um, so uh, the notion of a leading edge is, is a bit tricky here. And then Iodine had a heuristic in her paper that we translated as treating the most upstream invaded edge first and then breaking ties based on the amount of invasion. And then, uh, then we show our PAC solution as well. So here are our results on total costs in our, in our, in our problem. And um, uh, I wouldn't treat this super seriously because of course these were all heuristics and this is uh, an approximate optimal solution. And we can see that you know, it pays to optimize if you can. And of course, if your objective function is really the right one. Um, but, uh, but, but I think um, our, our hope is that trying to find optimal solutions does, does pay off. OK, well, now I'm going to talk about our wildfire management work. And uh, I have um, less material here. So um, uh, the, the, uh, for, for now, uh, seven or eight years, we've been working on this problem of managing wildfire in Eastern Oregon. So Eastern Oregon forests, uh, this is a, a drier part of the state, and it's characterized by these large ponderosa pine trees um, that then have an open understory. And we believe that this was the natural state. The ponderosas have a thick bark that is fire resistant, and the structure of this landscape, we believe, was maintained by frequent so-called ground fires that burn out the understory plants, uh, but do not damage the tall trees. Um, these fires may have been caused by, uh, actually promoted by the humans at that time or, and or by lightning strikes. But since the 1920s in the US, um, uh, fires have been suppressed in these forests. And the result is that they don't look nice and open like this, but instead they're full of uh, large stands of lodgepole pine that have grown in between the, 
the, uh, the, the um, Ponderosa Pine. Uh, so a heavy accumulation of fuels in the understory. And this is le leads to large catastrophic fires that kill all the trees, are able to reach up into the canopy and lead to huge firefighting costs, and even the lives of firefighters lost every year fighting these fires. So uh, we focused on a particular study area in the Deschutes National Forest. And the management goal for this region, this is owned by the US government. So it's a single owner setting, which is easy to deal with, a single fire manager. And uh, the goal is to return this landscape to its natural fire regime. It's divided up in about 4,000 of these little management units. And, um, and, the, and, and so um, I'll get back to that in a moment. But our management question that we've been exploring is, when lightning strike starts a fire, say in this management unit here, should we let it burn or should we extinguish it? Now the advantages of letting it burn is that it would um, uh, start removing fuel uh, and, it could, it serve, and it costs nothing to let a fire burn. Of course, the disadvantage is it might burn up valuable timber. It might, and, and although we're not modeling this, it might burn up houses it, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a cost to letting a fire burn as well. If we, if we suppress the fire, then we have to pay the cost of the fire suppression. And, and that's both the immediate cost and then there's the long-term cost that, that may create, lead to a more severe fire in the future. So um, we, we, at this point, we have not been able to um, uh, fully uh, find an optimal policy for this problem, but instead we have published two policy analysis papers where we evaluated fixed policies using Monte Carlo rollouts comparing alternative management techniques. And we've developed a series of progressively uh, simpler simulators. So our main simulator is called Firewoman, or more fancily, the uh, Oregon uh, Centennial Wildfire uh, Simulation. Um, and it combines a state-of-the-art wildfire simulator with a forest harvest simulation and a forest growth simulation. And it is extremely expensive to, to simulate. Even one fire can take many, many minutes or hours to, to simulate depending on how big the fire gets. So we built a simpler simulator called Fire Girl um, that's uh, much faster, si much more simple, um, and we validated it against Canadian forestry data. And then we have a toy simulator, which we wanted to call Fire Baby, but it's, um, uh, it's called Swim instead. Uh, so um, we formulate our let burn uh, problem as a markup decision process. Um, I, I just mentioned the cost of these simulators because uh, we really want to uh, minimize the number of times we have to invoke a simulator. Um, we, we, it's it's uh, it really, really a critical issue here. So we can formulate this let burn problem as a somewhat elaborate markup decision process. Um, uh, each state is the state of the landscape plus a fire ignition, a point, location of the ignition. And then the action is, do you let it burn or do you suppress it? And then the fire simulator runs and gives us the resulting landscape the, 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 and, um, and this is a stochastic transition because there's weather, uh, wind speed and humidity and temperature and so on that influence the behavior of the fire. And also, if we're suppressing it or not, that has an impact. Um, and then, uh, then we invoke a lightning simulator uh, to do the next ignition and that, that gives us the, the next state. And a reward depends on the initial state, uh, which action we perform and the outcome of the fire. Now, these are truly immense markup decision problems. They do not fit into memory at all. Each management unit has a, uh, has a, an amount and age of its trees and an amount of fuel load. Um, and if we uh, just simply uh, quant quantize that into 25 levels, we would still have 25 to the 4,000 power states because we have 4,000 management units. So it's absolutely crazy to, you, you could not possibly solve this exactly. Um, fortunately, our action space is small and our reward function is fairly straightforward. So um, uh, it's our transition function is, is the combination of two transitions. The first part is the wildfire simulator and the second uh, plus the, uh, uh, and then the lightning simulator multiplied together. And there's also uh, at the end of each fire season, we, we imagine that during the winter time, the trees grow and so new fuel accumulates. As I said, there's an official discount factor from the Forest Service, and our goal is to maximize the expected sum of discounted rewards. So um, there are no methods really out there that can solve this MVP. Uh, so we've been experimenting with uh, existing methods 
uh, and, and some new ones to try to solve it. So there's a, a bunch of methods that are known as policy gradient methods. And these basically can perform a uh, hill climbing search in the space of policies. You represent a policy as some kind of a parameterized function with parameters theta. And then you calculate the, basically the first derivative of the, of the uh, objective J with respect to theta using Monte Carlo trials. And then you can uh, hill climb by gradient ascent uh, using that gradient. Um, the alternative that we're currently pursuing is a form of Bayesian optimization. Um, and uh, I don't really have time to go into that, but, uh, but, but um, it, this is uh, uh, where you try to model the, the, your cost function and your uncertainty about the value of all these different policies. So the policy is, again, parameterized, but you're, you're uh, building a, a probabilistic model of what you think the value function lo looks like for different policies in different uh, parameter values. And, uh, and then sampling in a very smart way, different parameters. So uh, with policy gradients, uh, we ha have tried and failed to make it work. The gradients are very noisy, and they require very large samples, samples to stabilize, and we can't afford those large samples. Um, we actually found simple hill climbing, rather than these complex gradient calculations, was more reliable. Um, but again, it's still, but, but even if we put in the true gradient and followed it, we couldn't find good policies because the it turns out hill climbing doesn't necessarily get to good. There's large flat areas in our policy space. So we're now trying uh, this thing called SMAC that's from Frank Hutter's uh, work um, in collaboration with folks at UBC um, and now at Freiburg, where he is. And, uh, and Sean McGregor and Rachel Hauptman have been getting some initial results that are very promising. So we're thinking that this is going to be our, our solution right now. Um, one of the big lessons we learned, though, was that <coughs> we needed some software tools to help us. Uh, you know, this is often the lesson learned in any big software project is that um, you, uh, when you're building, when you're working with Markov decision problems, you need software engineering tools to help you, debugging and, to, and in particular visualization. So uh, uh, Sean McGregor uh, has developed uh, something called MDPViz, which is a visualization tool for uh, uh, when you're working with mark big markup decision processes and simulating trajectories through them to visualize how various variables like the fuel load in the forest or the cumulative timber loss, how they evolve over time. So these are essentially um, different quantiles of the, of the distribution over the trajectories. And these have been uh, amazingly informative to us. We've discovered several simulator bugs using this and you can give it a try uh, if you go to this uh, URL. Okay, so um, the, uh, the, the next thing we want to do um, is uh, in, the, in the Tamara's case is we're looking at constrained MVPs. And I don't have, uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I probably should move on and, and leave some time for questions. So we'll skip that. And let me just wrap up at this point with our lessons learned. So I'd say our first lesson is that we can significantly reduce, say by an order of magnitude or more, the sampling cost of PACRL methods by thinking hard about which states to sample. So because the simulators are so expensive, we can afford to think hard about uh, and use some significant computation to be smarter about sampling. And so uh, we showed the DDV algorithm that's based on this idea of some approximate value of information computation and the LGCV method that's based on um, uh, sampling uh, from, uh, with uh, two different confidence intervals. Um, and we found that optimal solutions to uh, our invasive species management problem are better than heuristic ones. That's not really a, a surprise, but it's nice to see um, uh, for, for those of us who love optimality. Um, and um, so uh, it's, it's uh, policy gradient methods uh, did not work for us in our wildfire uh, problems. And so uh, the other lesson we learned is that it's critical to have good visualization tools both to help programmers to debug the system, and also we hope for stakeholders to be able to understand how the system will behave under different proposed policies. Um, because we think that potentially the biggest application of our work is not to develop the, the world's best um, uh, policy for managing wildfires, but instead to, to provide a, a software framework in which uh, different stakeholders can explore uh, the consequences of, of the relative values of different uh, values in the landscape, and perhaps 
come to some agreement about uh, how to navigate the trade-offs among them. Okay, and with that, I'll stop and answer questions. Any questions? You can post them to chat or you can raise a hand and we will promote you to panelist. Okay, I see there's one question chat already from Sapreet Singh. What prior do we use on the basin optimization for parameterized policies? Um, the, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know that we know the precise answer for that. We're using this package called SMAC, um, and uh, it uses regression trees rather than Gaussian processes for the Bayesian optimization. Um, and so it, it, um, it, it calculates empirical uh, um, upper and lower confidence bounds uh, for each bin of uh, basically builds random forests um, for for uh, for modeling the the uh, value in the policy space uh, and gives confidence bounds on those and then uses expected improvement as its um, exploration function. So uh, I don't know if uh, maybe it's not really Bayesian. Um, so, it, but 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 it 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 uh, is working well. There's a second one. Okay. Um, what difference do you observe between heuristic policies and optimal policies? Were those inspected slash validated by ecology experts? Um, uh, I do not know the answer to part one, but part two is yes. So uh, Kim Hall um, is in the process of, of, of writing up papers from her PhD thesis in which she took the optimal so-called approximate optimal policies that that Maji calculated for her Tamarisk instances, and then uh, spent a long time studying them to try to understand how the, the algorithm was behaving. Um, uh, one thing that seemed to be um, uh, interesting about uh, the optimal solutions is that um, uh, sometimes they would uh, uh, aggressively uh, try to plant native species into the um, empty slots in order to occupy territory and only then start to work on um, uh, getting rid of the, the invaders. Uh, the, and, and that was something that, that um, mm. is a different than kind of, the usual focus has been on where are the invaders, but, but, uh, but where the natives are is equally important. Um, mm. and, and although seeds can, um, you can imagine a river network where um, you have native plants kind of uh, in the middle of the rivers and invaders above and below, or invaders above, and, and nothing below. Uh, uh, it is true that invasive seed can hop right over your, your native occupied place and reach the river network below you, but that is a lower probability event because uh, long distance transport is less probable. And so it does turn out that the notion of a barrier, which is a standard notion in expanding wavefront problems, it does make sense uh, in river networks. It, it's not quite, as, not quite as much sense as it does in a, in a species like cheatgrass which expands in, a, in an expanding wavefront. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, so, so yes, we're, we're, we, the, those papers will be published in the ecology literature, not in the computer science literature. Um, let's see. It seems that your policy optimization relies on good quality data, which doesn't always exist, and heuristics don't necessarily need to do well. Uh, did you do any sensitivity analysis to figure out how these different methods respond to noisy or uncertain data? Um, well, uh, we don't actually have data at all. Uh, we're really relying on, on uh, being able to trust the simulators. And that is a very uh, big assumption. Um, the, uh, in, in, in both cases, we relied on a third party simulation that in some sense was already validated by the literature. So um, uh, the, in the wildfire case, for instance, we're using the sort of industry standard simulator uh, uh, that was developed by the U.S. Forest Service called Farsight um, and something called uh, FVC, FV, I can't remember, Forest Vegetation uh, Simulator, FVS, um, and, and we built our own lightning simulator, so, which we did use data for. Um, so uh, it would be, uh, those, those are accepted by the community, but um, I'm sure that they can undergo further validation. Um, so we do do a lot of sensitivity analysis, of course, uh, and that's another reason to have algorithms that run fast 
because you don't just run them once, you have to run them uh, hundreds of times where you're trying out different variations to see, well, how sensitive are these results to the exact costs of different actions, uh, the probability of, for instance, in the river network, we can adjust the probability that trees will die spontaneously, the relative fecundity of the different species, the relative competitive advantage of the different species, and so on. And uh, of course, we've done all of those. In fact, there's really a need for good tools to help people take the outputs of our uh, optimized policies and understand them. Um, it's not so useful to give someone a big table that says, well, here's what you do in each state. You figure it out. <laughs> uh, so we also had to build a visualizer for the, um, for the river networks. Let's see, what is the time scale relative to the MDP single step? Is one step in an MDP X months? Does this choice change the policy or cost of simulation? Um, let's see. I'm not sure. Um, in terms of the real world, um, the step size is essentially uh, typically one year. Like for the river network problem, each year you get a chance to send people out and, and do um, uh, you know, planting and, and killing the wildfire problem. Well, there's two time scales. There's the time scale of individual fires within a fire season, and then there's this annual time scale as well. Um, so Tom, before you answer Paul's question, uh, Oscar Viles has asked a question on Q&A. Okay. For populating your river edge network initially, why use a simulator instead of analyzing data from the along the rim? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, uh, I think um, whenever you're doing collaborative research, uh, you rely on their colla your collaborators to make some, some strategic decisions. In this case, uh, my collaborator was Joe Albers, and um, her preferred um, research methodology is to study very stylized instances of problems that have been abstracted and simplified from the real world. So the, our, our state transition model, um, while we parameterized it uh, using uh, published data about Tamarisk, um, uh, it is not a, a high, really um, a super good model of, perhaps of Tamarisk uh, behavior. Um, you know, we were interested in the general question of, of how, what do different optimal policies look like and how do they change as you change different properties of the, of the invasive species. So um, we really are not trying to provide any advice to Tamarisk managers in this case. Whereas in the wildfire problem, my collaborator Claire Montgomery uh, is very interested in actually uh, engaging the fire managers in uh, trying to use the results of our research. And so that's why we're using a full bore, high fidelity simulation that is the best in the state of the art. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, that's why we have a lot more results for the river networks than we do for the wildfire. <laughs> <laughs> then Paul Fackler, back on chat. Okay. Is there software available? Able to explore these methods with our own simulators, system simulators. For Tamarisk, uh, uh, we, we have published the simulator. Um, uh, it was uh, actually part of the, um, there's a reinforcement learning competition each year. And so you can go to the RL competition website and, uh, and you, can, you can get our simulator and many others uh, to try things out on. Um, uh, and, I, and, and Sean McGregor's, uh, I believe, also, you can access it by his uh, MDP Viz site. Okay, and then um, may, uh, let's see the next question. Pri Priya Dante, what happens if you optimize not in terms of expectation, expectation, but for example, worst case? What a wonderful uh, um, question. Yes, this is the part I, I kind of uh, um, skipped over. So. Um, I think in a lot of sustainability problems, there uh, you really want to have not just an expected utility, but some kind of risk-sensitive utility, right? I mean, in expectation, it could be that that we that that our species survives and does not go extinct, but, um, like the native species in our rivers. But maybe the autumn policy still has a twenty percent extinction rate, um, and uh, because uh, and, and so just because on average things are okay doesn't mean that that we don't have a lot of bad outcomes. So, um, so there are a bunch of different um, uh, formulations for markup decision problems to introduce a risk sensitivity. Um, a lot of them have come out of finance. 
The one that we're, uh, that, that I think is most intuitive is called the constrained MDP. And the idea is, for instance, let's say that we're interested in, um, uh, def we define, we both have our economic outcome uh, objective, which is treating the TAM risk. And then maybe we could also ha have a, uh, an objective to say that the native species, the pro that the, the probability of it going extinct should be less than say 1% over the next 100 years. So now we want to find the policy, uh, we, we want to restrict our attention only to policies that guarantee that, that extinction probability below 1%. And among those, then we try to find the policy that minimizes the total cost of management. So um, I like that because I think it's, it doesn't require your stakeholder to say, well, how many millions of dollars is it worth to me to have this species not go extinct, right? No one can answer that question. What is the value of a particular species? That's just, a, or, uh, or, or if you're thinking about aesthetic values, uh, recreation values, it, it's, you can try to, uh, you know, there's this whole field of ecosystem services and people do try to put economic numbers on these things. But I think for a lot of our objectives are really, um, uh, it's, it's difficult or impossible to do that. And so I like to think of it in turn, instead in terms of these constrained MDPs. But um, let's see. Paul asked about, I guess, for, um, uh, I meant for other problems. Um, so for the wildfire simulation, um, I don't believe we've released the simulator yet, but um, it's all uh, based on, on public software and we will release it. Uh, so it will all be open sourced. Um, we're still finding bugs and I guess we'll probably keep finding them even after we release it, but uh, um, uh, we will do that. Okay, and then Yadin says, uh, can constrained MDP also be used to set a level of interpretability of the policy? Oh my, um, not uh, with the, in the, in the way that we're solving um, uh, our policies right now, we're using a table representation, right? Where we just have a complete listing of all the states and what action you should execute in each of them. So, um, uh, we don't have any way, I mean, that's a big issue for us right now is that that is not an interpretable policy. Um, and, uh, and we've thought about applying uh, relational machine learning algorithms to those tables to try to re -trans translate the policy into something that's easier to understand. Um, and I think that's a very interesting research challenge for the community. So do we have one more? No, we, I, guess, I think we're done. Um, Yadin has a, looks like she has a final comment. Yeah, Yadin was saying, well, we might want to um, penalize policies that keep uh, jumping around doing different things at different time steps. Um, yeah, I don't know if that would be more interpretable or not, but, but I think certainly policies that have a short description in some interpretable language, that would be a great uh, thing to try to do. Okay, I well, think thank we you are... for your attention and for your questions. And uh, you know, if you have any more, you can send them to my email, which is tgd at cs.org.edu, among others. Thanks so much, Tom. This was great. And um, we will have this uh, video online unless uh, Tom objects um, uh, shortly, and um, so people can uh, view it. And again, Tom has offered to take questions over email. Thanks so much, Tom. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.